humanity, us as humans, we have a long history of being treasure hunters. We love stories about pirates burying treasure, unexpected explorers coming across cities of gold, walking in the Karua, getting the career gold. As humans, we love stories about receiving or people getting wealth, finding treasure. Our history is full of people who traveled to distant lands, to dangerous places, to encounter hostile people simply because of rumors that there might be wealth and riches over there. Think of the Spanish conquistadors who traveled the great oceans simply because of rumors of cities of gold. Think of the great gold rush in, in the United States where people would literally move into the desert knowing the risks of dying simply because of rumors of gold that is pouring out of the ground. So many people today die and people throughout history have died in pursuit of wealth and riches. But why? Why? Why would people willingly risk their lives pursuing something, knowing that they might die horrible, gruesome deaths, pursuing something that they have no certainty of getting? Well, the answer is quite simple. Because these people value these riches, value the potential of having this treasure worth more than even their own lives. They would rather risk their lives than risk living their lives without the potential of getting these treasures that they so often hear of or think of. And so we might look at these people, we might look at these great explorers who, travels, who travel great oceans, great explorers who go across deserts, we look at these people and we think, that's crazy. I would not brace a hurricane simply because of rumors of gold buried somewhere else. I would not, I would not brace or even dare starvation or dehydration simply because of rumors of some wealth hidden somewhere. But before we look at these people and think, wow, these people are crazy, or maybe it's simply because they are greedy, Allow me to remind us all that we are all very similar. You might not be bracing the great hurricanes of the Atlantic or the great Sahara Desert in search of rumors of wealth and gold, but most of you sell half of your day to someone else simply to get a fraction of the money that you make for them. Most of you I know sitting here go as much as selling 16 hours of your 24 hours every day, giving it up, not living your life, living for someone else simply because of what you can get out of it. Now, we might not be trading our lives, bracing the Atlantic or crossing deserts, but we still trade our lives in pursuit of other things, pursuit of wealth. Instead of oceans, it's desks, and instead of deserts, it is offices. But why? Why do we do this? Well, we, we know the obvious answer, right? We live in an economy, we need money, we need to survive, we need to provide. But why would people even leave those stuff or place more burdens on themselves to get even more? Well, the answer is actually very simple. As human beings, we are created by God to chase what is valuable. It's in our DNA. God designed us to pursue value. God designed us to pursue what is worthy and what is of worth. And we will even see that exemplified in the next parable that Jesus, that we will be looking at as taught by Jesus. So please take your Bibles, open up at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, and we will start at verse 46. Matthew chapter 13, verse 46. While you page there, allow me to pray for us. Lord, my heart is burdened. It is difficult to explain 
a simple text like this because of its deepness, its weightiness, its importance. Lord, I pray that by some miracle, the Holy Spirit will enlighten those who are sitting here, those who know you, that they might realize the treasure that they have, and those who do not know you might pursue the treasure that they should know they need. Lord, help. Pray this in your holy name. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, verse 46. If you don't have a Bible, please grab one there at the back. Follow along. Matthew 13, let's start. Sorry, let's start at verse 44. Apologies, I said 46, 44. The parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, that's a short parable. That's probably one of the shortest parables that Jesus tells. In fact, it's two parables that each make up among the shortest parables or the shortest teachings told by Jesus. So, this morning's sermon is most likely going to be a bit shorter. Maybe I'm hoping for that, but don't worry, I'll make up for that next week. We'll just add the times together and, no, I'm just joking. Don't, don't, please come back next week, right? Now, very often when you hear preachers preach on parables, especially parables from Matthew chapter 13, one mistake that is very often made, is that these parables are treated separately and individually. For example, you'll hear a sermon on the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great value, and very often they will forget that these parables, these two short parables, were not written or spoken in a void. In fact, the whole chapter, chapter 13 of the book of Matthew, is about the kingdom of God. The whole chapter, chapter 13, is Jesus just rapid-firing parables. But about what? About the kingdom of God. And so in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells some of his most famous parables that you all know. The parable of the sower, remember that one? A sower went out and he sowed sow seeds and some fell among the road, some fell among the, the, the fawns and some fell on the, the dry ground, some fell among the good soil. And then Jesus explains, this is how different people receive the word of God. Then Jesus speaks about the parable of the weeds, saying that a sower goes out and he sows in his fields, but then his enemy comes at night and he sows weeds among the crops that were sown. So that when they start to come up, the the, the crops come up with weeds. And then Jesus says, that's how it's going to be like in the visible kingdom, in the church. There will be those who belong to God, but among them will be those who, who pretend to be among them, but are imposters. And then Jesus tells the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven, explaining that the kingdom of God is something that will grow and grow and grow. And then we get to our parables, the hidden treasure. The kingdom of God is like a treasure. It's like a fine pearl. Then we get the parable of the net, then the parable of the old and the new treasures. You see, Matthew chapter 13 is Jesus constantly teaching you parables in order to help explain to you what the kingdom of God is like and what it is about. So the parables in chapter 13 tell you about the nature of God's kingdom, it tells you about the growth of God's kingdom, and it tells you about the value of God's kingdom, and how different people will respond to the kingdom of God as well. And so our focus for this morning is to simply look at the parable that Jesus teaches that explains the value of the kingdom of God. All right, so we We've been using this word a lot, this phrase, kingdom of God. Well, if you read Matthew, you'll notice that Matthew also has a different phrase, kingdom of heaven. Now, friends, there are some people out there who will try and convince you that Jesus was speaking of two different things and two different dispensations and conspiracy theorists, TikTok theologians, stay away. 
If you just read Matthew chapter 13, you'll see Jesus in the same sentences uses the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven interchangeably. It's just a Jewish way of speaking. So when he speaks of the kingdom of God, what is he referring to? Well, he's referring to God's reign, God's rulership over those who have been reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. When he speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he's referring to God's relationship over those and with those who through faith have come to know God, through faith in Christ. In short, in summary, when he speaks about the kingdom of God, he's speaking about heaven, but not just about heaven. It also includes the church, but not just heaven and the church. In summary, if we were to give one word to what we mean by the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, we simply mean this, eternal life, eternity, eternity. So in chapter 13 of the book of Matthew, Jesus talks about the growth of the kingdom and how people will respond to the kingdom, some in faith, some with interest, some with disgust. And he talks about the value of the kingdom. That's our passage. That's our parable. And so let's maybe just read verse 44 again. Verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Well, what is the treasure? Well, the text says it quite obviously, right? The treasure is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Now, I've heard sermons preached on this that says, you are the treasure. You are, that's how special you are. You are the treasure and God is the one buying the field. Yes, that's theologically you can maybe argue for that. But that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is making clear that the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, is the treasure in this circumstance. Not you or I. You or I, you and I, we're the guy walking in the field, stumbling across this treasure, realizing its value, and then making everything, doing everything we can to get a hold of it. Now, whenever we come to a passage of scripture like this, one of the things I always ask myself is, Why tell this parable? Why include this piece of writing in the life of Jesus? I mean, Jesus lived for 33 years on earth, ministered for three years, and all we have is a few short accounts of his life and ministry. So these accounts that we have must be really important if they make it into the canon of Scripture. I mean, John, in the end of his gospel, in John 21, says, these are but some of the works of Jesus. For if we had written all of them, there will not be enough books in the world to contain them all. So why include this parable? Out of everything Jesus said, not just that day, but in his life, why this parable? Well, I imagine someone might have asked him, Jesus, we constantly hear you speaking about the kingdom of God. Why should I be concerned with it? Why should the kingdom of God matter to me? Then Jesus tells an analogy. He tells, speaks in the form of a metaphor or what we call a parable in order to make clear the worth, the worth or the value of the kingdom of God. This treasure that is the kingdom of God is what Jesus wants to make clear the worth of the kingdom. Now, I find it very interesting that we have two parables, two short parables, each one with regard to to treasure or value or items of worth. The one that we just read now, verse 44, tells of a man who just stumbles upon it. He wasn't out looking for treasure. He just stumbles upon it. And then when he finds it, when he discovers this treasure, he immediately does a cost-benefit analysis. Immediately. He, he's in his mind, you, you know that meme about the lady that looks and you see the math going over? That's him. He sees this treasure, he's thinking. He's thinking, and he, he quickly realizes, I need this treasure. And everything that I have 
is not worth as much as this treasure, and therefore he joyfully gets rid of everything he owns. It says, verse 44, the second half, then in his joy, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. That's how valuable the treasure is. In this case, the kingdom of God is. For many years, especially when I was still in high school, I was irritating back then, then as well. I also preached to people. But back in high school, I thought my job as a preacher was I need to convince people to do things or to buy into things that they don't really want. Uh, that's what I thought. It's like, I, I need to convince people that they need to go to church and they need to do the things that they don't really want to do. Praise God, it, it, he changed me. He showed me from Scripture. No, 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 no. The job description is different. The job description is not trying to convince people to buy into things, into the kingdom of heaven, be, even if they don't really want to. My job is very simply actually to do the impossible, to try and formulate with words to show people how much worth the kingdom of heaven is compared to everything else they have, to, com compared to everything else they, 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 they own, to show them, listen, I love what you are, I love what you have, but there is something greater. Compared to that, dirt. Why dirt when you can have diamonds? That's what this man came across. He got rid of everything he had. He sold it to acquire that treasure and he did it joyfully. He did it joyfully. He knew that he had stumbled upon something that was far greater in value than anything that he possessed. Now remember, Jesus is teaching a parable. Parables only have one point. We often make mistakes when we try to go too deep into parables and analyze the parable. For example, Jesus is not teaching you that if you want to go to heaven, if you want eternal life, that you need to buy your way into eternal life. That's not what he's teaching you. The rest of the Bible makes that clear. It's not about how much you can pay for the kingdom of heaven. It's how much you want the kingdom of heaven. This man wanted it so much that he was willing to give up everything just to acquire it, to acquire this treasure. And the same question is posed to you. How much do you want it? It is completely free. Jesus says the kingdom of God is completely free, but it will cost you everything. How does that make sense? Well, just bank that thought for a while. We're going to get back to it shortly. Let's move on to the second parable, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So this, the second person is different to the first person. The first person was just strolling through the, the fields and stumbled upon a treasure and made every effort to gain it. The second person is a merchant. He's traveling. He's looking for fine products. He's looking for pearls to acquire so that he can sell it, he can make a profit. And then while he's looking, he, he walks into this, this shop that is on the outskirts of town that no one goes to visit because it's dark and cluttered and dusty. And as he's just simply strolling through, he discovers the pearl of most value that he has ever seen in his whole life sitting there on the shelf. And he realizes he needs this pearl. This is worth more than anything he has. He's going to try and strike a bargain. He's going to sell everything he has, all the pearls he has in stock, all his stock of his company, everything. He needs this pearl. It's worth more than anything and everything put together. And so this second person, this merchant, he was deliberate. He was looking for what is of most value compared to the first person who just stumbled across what is of most value. Again, this pearl... This pearl is simply a metaphor for the kingdom of heaven, for the kingdom of God. He was looking for it. He found it. He made every effort to acquire it. And so, friends, this week has been very difficult in studying this passage of Scripture because it gripped me, it wrestled me, 
And I had great frustration, great agony, trying to think of how I can formulate into words the preciousness of the kingdom of heaven. And I've concluded that not in a thousand languages I would be able to do that. Not because I need to convince you of the preciousness of heaven, but I am unable to provide or formulate any way of articulating how precious the eternal state truly is. How do I convince you of the preciousness of the kingdom of God if you can't see it already? The main idea of these two parables is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is worth more than anything you could lose to gain it. That's the point. Yes, we so often when we speak to our children about Trusting in Jesus. Being faithful to Jesus. We tell them, yes, you could lose some friends. They might mock you. Yes, you're going to lose that. But, but it's better. Jesus is worth it. But sometimes we forget to bring that up to our level. The kingdom of God is worth more than anything you could lose to gain it. How do I convince someone of the value and the worth of our Lord Jesus Christ? If you cannot see it already, not that his value and his worth is hard to see, but how do words express the extent of his glory and his majesty? Not a thousand languages could do justice to the preciousness of our Savior and how awesome our Lord is. Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of the 1800s said, if Christ is not all to you, He is nothing to you. He will not go into partnership to be people's part-time saviors. If he be something, he must be everything. And if he be not everything, he is nothing to you. Maybe I can remind you of who our God is. Because friends, when we speak of the kingdom of heaven, again, Do not think of Bugs Bunny on a cloud playing a harp. When we speak of the eternal state, when we speak of the kingdom of God, we are basically just pointing to Jesus Christ, the precious one. And maybe I can remind you of who this God is. He is the creator God who created everything that you see around you. How often we forget that the mountains were sculpted by his hands, the greatest of towers that make up the mountains, to the smallest of insects intricately woven by his creativity. That at this moment he sustains all life. Every time you breathe, you suck in the mercy of God who keeps your heart beating and your lungs functioning. Our God is the planner of all men's futures and he and all he and all things that are good find their origin in God. All things that are good find their origin in God. Beauty, all that is beautiful, comes from the mind of God. Colors, uh, think about it, friends. I've I've used this illustration before, but can you sit in your seat right now and think of a color that has never existed before up until now? Invent a new color. Give it a name. You cannot do that. But all colors come from the mind of God. All beauty, all reason comes from the mind of God. Love comes from God. It is not that God is loving. God is love. The concept of love originates from Him. The concept of goodness, the concept of light, all things that are pleasurable and pleasing come from our God. And this God, this God calls you to enter into his kingdom, to enter into his domain, and to entrust your eternity to him. Friend, I cannot think of a better deal than to have the all-powerful, all-wise, all-good, all-loving God tell you, entrust it all to me. Just give it to me. This God calls us to his kingdom. 
Not only is this God awesome in his being, but he is awesome in his deeds. Now I can work you through the Bible and remind you of the great flood, the Exodus account, the great battles waged by the people of God and the victories he gave them. But maybe I can just skip all of that and go to the main event and remind you of what it cost God to acquire you. Friends, if you are not found this morning in the kingdom of God, you are not in no man's land. You are in the kingdom of darkness. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Jesus has delivered us, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Friends, there are no middle grounds. There are only the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of His Son, the kingdom of heaven. There is only Adam and there is only Christ. There is no middle ground. And what did it cost our God to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness? Why are you, why were you in the kingdom of darkness? Because you rebelled against your creator. James says, if we have broken one of his laws, we have broken all of his laws. And because we have sinned against an eternal God, the punishment is eternal. Jesus, God, became a man and lived a perfect life under the law of God, never once transgressing the law of God. The only person to have lived a life in full and perfect obedience to God. And then he went to the cross. And what happened on the cross? Yes, we've seen the movies. We, we see the pictures. He was beaten, scourged, tortured, mocked, spat on, crown of thorns, forced into his skull, but those were nothing compared to what he had to endure on the cross. When he prayed in the garden the night before his capture, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. What was that cup? What was in the cup? It wasn't the beatings of men. Because why would his disciples after him go to their crosses and their deaths with joy, singing praises as they were thrown to the lions? Because in the cup that was to be given to Jesus was the wrath of God, was hell and torment and judgment that would be poured out on him on the cross. You see, on the cross, Jesus became the concentration of all things despised by God. On the cross, Jesus became sin. So that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 On the cross, He became the concentration of evil. And God poured out His wrath, His anger, His vengeance, His justice in all holiness on the Son of God. His only Son whom He loved, who in that moment became all that He hated. And Jesus was judged and cursed and crushed and damned on the cross in order to fulfill the punishment that we deserve. To take on the debt that we owe God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, that for our sake, friends, for your sake, you sitting here, for your sake, God made Christ to become sin so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. That not only was all our sin placed on Christ, but His righteousness covers us as a coat. I shared with my wife that this week as I was reading, I, I, I was reading through Philippians, and I stumbled upon a very, very famous passage, but it gripped my heart anew. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, starting at verse 7. The Apostle Paul, he, he's busy explaining why you cannot be saved by just being a good person. Because if anyone could have been saved by being a good person, Paul would be the best person. But Paul explains, verse 7, But whatever gain I had, gain meaning obedience, trying to earn my way into heaven. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of Jesus. That man who stumbled across the treasure, this merchant who found the pearl, 
he looked at it, that treasure. And in that moment, he realized that compared to this, everything is rubbish. Compared to having this, I can count all things as a loss gladly because this is worth more. This is what Paul is saying. For the sake of Christ, I count all things as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and I am to be found in Him. Listen to this, friends. Paul says, and I am to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from Him. Friends, faith in Christ covers you with the righteousness of Christ. His righteousness is taken off and put over you as a coat so that God's perfect standard is met. Friends, those who struggle with the concept of Christ's substitution, those who do not see the necessity of why Christ had to die for sin and why He had to be punished and why we need His righteousness, those who do not grasp that concept have one fundamental problem. They have a low view of God. The God at which the angels do not even dare to look at as they cover themselves, shouting, holy, holy, holy. That God is so holy, so transcendent, that we tend to make the mistake and think that He is like us. This holy God is holy to the superlative degree. Not just holy, not just holy, holy, but holy, holy holy. He cannot stand sin. He cannot stand unrighteousness, injustice. But the same God who could have so easily condemned us as His creatures, who owe Him worship, but who rebel against Him, the same holy God acted in love and made a plan of escape, made a plan of salvation. Spurgeon again says, Jesus is speaking to you. He's speaking to you. He says, there poor sinner, take my garment, take my coat, put it on. And you shall stand before God as if you were Christ. And I will stand before God as if I had been a sinner. I will suffer in the sinner's stead. And you shall be rewarded for works that you did not do, but which I did for you. That is Christ's message to you this morning. Friends, I want this morning to do what is impossible. And that is to describe in a few short words the preciousness of our Lord. I'm thinking of passages like Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph, where Asaph is tempted by the goods of this world. He sees the wicked prospering. He sees the wicked doing well, living in comfort and luxury, and he is tempted to go after that. And then he is reminded of what he has is more precious. Psalm 73 verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Friends, if you trust in Christ, not only are you given to God, but God gives Himself to you. Think of Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Think of what that psalm says. Don't let familiarity cloud or numb you to the preciousness of what God is saying. That He is your shepherd. You know, the word shepherd is just where we get the word, the word pastor is where we get the word shepherd from. The word pastor means shepherd. So if we were to just take that that passage differently, you could say, the Lord is my pastor. I shall not want Why would you go after anyone else or anything else when God is saying, just come, I will take care of all you need. Who better than me? Think of Psalm 16 verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
Think of Psalm 37. Psalm 37 verse 4, where the psalm writer writes, and he says the following, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Friends, you know what's the key to getting the desires of your heart? Is to make God the desire of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you Himself. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, which makes me stand in awe before God, our God. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. But friends, when we speak of the kingdom of God this morning, I'm not just referring to some abstract place, some abstract notion of what you should be desiring. When I'm speaking of the kingdom of God this morning, I'm simply talking about Jesus Christ. John 17 verse 3, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that you know me. This is eternal life, that you may know me. Friends, if the preciousness of Christ is something that does not draw you, it means that your heart is dead. In the words of Ezekiel, your heart is stone. And God must replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh. Now friends, think about our parables that we just read. Parable of the merchant and the parable of the traveler. Both of them came across something that was so worth it was so worthy of all that they had that they gladly got rid of everything they own in order to acquire it. And I said a few minutes ago that the kingdom of God is completely free. It's given to you. Its, it's hand is open towards you. It's free for you to grab a hold of. All that it will cost you is everything. How can I say that? Well, remember what Jesus' words were in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus is speaking. He says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, these two people, this man in the field and this merchant, they traded in their whole lives to acquire this treasure because they could not imagine living their lives without it, without its value, its worth, and its beauty. Jesus is saying the same. You think that you have lived up until now? You think that you have experienced the joy? Compared to what I'm offering you, you have not lived. You have not experienced joy. But in order to acquire it, in order to acquire this treasure which is Christ, you must forsake all that you are and run to Christ. Jim Elliot, the missionary who died in South America, he said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Think about that. Do not be that fool. Why will you not give away what you anyway would never be able to keep in order to get what you can never lose? Christ. Eternity. Friends, Christ is calling you now to commit to the kingdom of God. Let go of the dirt in your hands and grab a hold of what is valuable. Friends, wholeheartedly storm the gates of heaven. Storm the kingdom of heaven because the gates are standing wide open. This morning, I'm just a messenger. I'm just standing by the gates pleading to you, calling to you, come in. Come in. All are welcome. Everyone can come in. 
Be rescued from the coming judgment. Find shelter in the one who loves you and died for you. It will cost you, friends, to follow Christ. But friends, it will cost you far more if you do not. The reality is that some here are like the tares in Matthew 13, and some are like the crops that are planted this morning. This morning, who am I? I'm standing before you as the person in the parable of the sower, throwing out the seeds. What I'm saying this morning will be falling on hard hearts. Some of it might be falling on hearts that are surrounded by thorns. This might excite you for a while, but as soon as Monday starts, the love of this world will choke out the faith. But I'm praying and I'm pleading to God that some of the seed this morning falls on good soil. Christ is calling. Christ is calling. My prayer is this, that these words fall on fertile soil. Let go of the anchor that you are holding on, the anchor of the love of this world. It's sinking you down into hell. It's dragging you in deeper. Just let go of it. Grab a hold of what is truly valuable. Let go of it. And grab a hold of Christ, who is the true treasure. You know what I find very fascinating about Matthew chapter 13? Is we have these two parables that we just read now. And each of them is an attempt to explain how valuable the kingdom of heaven is. But what I found very fascinating is that sandwiching these two parables before it and after it, Jesus almost tells the exact same parable. So he tells a parable, then he tells the parable of the worth of heaven that we just examined, and then after it, he tells almost the exact same parable as the one just before. Jesus says in verse 36, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the, this world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burnt with fire, so it will be at the end of the age when the Son of Man will send His angels. Jesus says that right now, the church, the kingdom of God, will be a mixture between those who are the sons of God and those who only pretend to be the sons of God. And then later, in verse 47, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and it gathered fish of every kind. And when the net was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. Right now, according to Jesus, among us are sitting those who are just here for the sake of appearances, maybe just here for the sake of traditions. Friend, if that is you this morning, Run to Christ. Run to Christ. His arms are open and heaven is wide open for you to run to Christ. We are made to pursue what is valuable. Every single one of you. You're made to pursue what is of most worth. So each of you this morning will make a choice. Is the treasure hidden in the field, valuable to you? It is valuable. It is of immense value, more than anything you are or can have. But you need to determine if it's valuable enough for you to grab a hold of it. Or will you value the anchor of this world that will drag you into hell? Do you want to find meaning? Do you want to find joy? Do you want to find love? Run to Christ. Do you want to find fulfillment and happiness? Look to Christ. Do you want to live for a mission that matters? Follow Christ. Follow Christ. I'm asking you, take that step of faith. In closing, I want to read for you a poem by a writer called C.T. Studd. He writes the following. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life 
will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon it will be fleeting, the hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before His judgment seat. Only one life, it will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a brief few years, each with its burdens, its hopes and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self, or in His will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep, in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whatever the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn. Living for thee and living alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say, it was worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. No sermon in history has ever fallen so short of the mark of and the value of a passage of Scripture. May the Holy Spirit work in our hearts. May Christ be the treasure of our hearts. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for your beautiful word. May it warm us, inspire us, encourage us, instill a love in us. Christ, be our all in all. May we find our worth not in what we own, but in our Lord who died for us, who covers us with His righteousness. Our Lord who brings us to His Father, not as servants, but as sons. Amen.